Hello, good evening, and welcome to session five of the Entrepreneur Speaker Series presented by the State 48 Foundation. We are coming to you live from the Center for Entrepreneurial Innovations in downtown Phoenix, and tonight's session is being produced by EIC Agency, so we want to make thank both of them for making this possible here tonight, and we want to thank you for joining us live, and we want to thank you for those of you who are joining us here in person. We're excited to have you here with us this evening, and I know we switched it up on you. It's a Tuesday. Everybody's like, what? Tuesday, not Wednesday? So thank you for rearranging your schedules to join us here this evening. So I am Vanessa Ramirez. I am the traffic anchor for Channel 12, Monday through Friday, early in the morning. And I'm also the in-game host for the Arizona Diamondbacks. So if you haven't been out to a game this season, you better hurry up because this weekend is the last weekend. They're wrapping it up on Sunday. So not the best year, but we'll do better next year. So if this is your first time joining us, first of all, where have you been? This is session five and you are missing out on valuable free information. So if you have missed out on these past sessions, you can go ahead and watch them on YouTube. Just go to the State 48 Foundation Instagram for more information. Okay, so if this is your first time, let me bring you up to speed. So the State 48 Foundation was born from a lifestyle and apparel company called State 48. So I'm gonna share with you their mission so you can find out what they're all about, okay? So I'm gonna read it so I don't mess it up. So our mission is to enrich and strengthen Arizona through thoughtful partnerships, inspired community action, and investment in the change makers of tomorrow. We started the foundation to be able to give back to Arizona's many communities. And as an entrepreneur born venture, we wanted to begin with the startup community. So that's exactly why they started this speaker series. They've invited some remarkable people in Arizona, some CEOs, some founders and experts to share their tips and stories with you to help inspire you to get going to start that business. Or if you've already started your business and you have an LLC to help take you to the next level. Now, we've already had some remarkable speakers join us in these past sessions. We had an attorney. We've had CEOs. We've had mentors joining us, giving us all valuable information. And tonight will not disappoint either. We have two amazing speakers joining us. The focus is on branding and marketing. So we have Lorena Garcia, who is the CEO and co-founder of Mashka. And then we have Dominic Orozco, who is the CMO with Gila River Hotels and Casinos. So I also want you to stick around after the session because we have some valuable information on how you can win some great prizes if you fill out that survey. And I know you're thinking another survey. Yes, another survey, but you want to win some great prizes. And so you do not want to miss out on that. Okay, so Gila River Hotels and Casinos is everywhere. They are doing an amazing job branding. I mean, for the Arizona Diamondbacks, I say their name like three, four times during the games with our promos. They work with all the local Valley teams here. They also work with radio stations like 101.5 and of course, local companies like State 48. So they are definitely doing it right. Here to tell us more about it is Dominic Orozco. That's, that's the, the largest applause I've received um, in the last two years during the pandemic. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, thank you, State 48 Foundation, for being uh, great partners of the community, Gila River Indian community, and uh, the Gila River Hotels and Casinos. So a little bit about myself here. Um, as stated before, CMO for Gila River Hotels and Casinos. Been there about five and a half years. Uh, you will notice the, the brand of the casino took a shift about five years ago um, in a new direction and really outlining themselves as a different category. A little bit about my background here. Um, I've been 20 years in the gaming business. I know it sounds long, but it's not really. Um, hospitality and advertising agencies, I've done both. Uh, so I was on the operations side for 14 years and then moved out to the agency and did some agency work as well to learn a little bit more about the branding and then take it back to the operations. Um, I worked in jurisdictions of New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Arizona. And uh, I specialize in branding. Uh, sports partnerships, as stated, guerrilla techniques, love, love, love guerrilla techniques, and uh, call to action promotions. I will, I will try to get your attention no matter what, whatever it takes. And we've done some crazy things in guerrilla to get your attention for the brand. So what I want you guys to take away from my 20 minutes here is that exactly this. I have one slide and one slide only. This right here is exactly how Gila River Hotels and Casinos brand works in one page. The whole idea was to simplify a brand so it's attainable. People can have a, a strict discipline on what they need to do and everything that happens fits within this. So I'm gonna unpack this for you. Um, before I got to Gila River, I noticed that they had a brand before I was even developed or I got there. And they started off as a sports centric brand from the beginning. They had the Cardinals, they had the Coyotes and they had the Diamondbacks um, out of the gate. And they've been longtime partners. 
Uh, we just acquired the Suns and Mercury, uh, as well as ASU Athletics. Um, so sports always been a part of our DNA. So everything we did, we said, how do we bring that to life? So that was the first metric. Then we figured and realized that we are the largest gaming enterprise in the Valley. We have three properties. Nobody else has that. That's a unique part of us that nobody can replicate. Let's add that to a brand pillar. Nobody can replicate sports centric brand. And then we had the UDU mantra. This UDU mantra comes from a lot of research. If there's anything when you develop a brand, make sure you implement research as a part of it. Know what your people are saying about your brand. We as marketers all think we have the answer and we know exactly what a brand should look like or be. It's not our show, it's their show. So when we put this together, we realized that people that choose gaming and casinos have high stress jobs. They could work for doctors, they could be lawyers, they could be news anchors, they could be owners of businesses. All these people have high stress jobs. They come here to relax and be themselves. So that's where you do you mantra came from. So you can come be yourself and not apologize for it. So everything we do in our branding has to fit within these three categories. This bottom area right here is things I learned as, as coming up in the business was these are credos that we will live by in the marketing department. We will be large in life. Everything we do, I talked about Gorilla Techniques, right? Gorilla Marketing, that's large in life. It creates a splash, makes special events special, and flawless execution. I told the team, if we do all of these within this realm here, we will be perfectly fine and we'll hit every single target that we need to. This is the last piece. This right here is, is called a customer journey. And I know you've heard that in many different areas. This is a simplified version of that. I felt like I would use apple trees. I'm not sure, I don't really care for apples, but I figured I'd use them anyways. Um, but it shows the process of a tree of growth into dying. What happened and what was happening before is we were saying inside this quadrant right here, every marketing effort we did, every branding effort we did fit within this because it felt good. It was always reassuring, they always showed up, it was always dependent, it always showed there. But what was happening is we weren't growing our market, we weren't appealing to new people, and we weren't watching people that were falling out from the bottom. Think of a funnel, right? You have a funnel and you throw two on top, but five drop off as customers, you're losing the game. So what we decided to do is this is our block of the funnel to stop this, revive and, and reclaim. These are dying trees, declining customers. Keep your loyal players, but also acquire and grow. This is branding. This is a lot of casino activation. And this is a lot of database mining right here. So if I broke into three categories, the whole goal was to get it right to the top in the center part. So in a nutshell, I wanted to make sure that we stay disciplined to our brand. This is it. This is what makes up our brand. Everything you see now with Gila River, if you look at it, you'll go, that makes complete sense of sports, et cetera, you to you. That's where it all came from. The team prides itself on this. And everything we do is to acquire and grow, retain to loyalty, and reclaim and revive back to the middle. So it all goes to this peak. Uh, we're looking to launch an expansion here in about two months. Um, it's a $150 million expansion. We easily could have focused on this area alone and just catered to the players that we already had. This expansion will cater to a 21 to 45 demographic. You will see a totally different look of the brand. You will see a different look of amenities. They will all cater to this area to acquire a group that's growing this level. So if there's anything I, I can give this to you, I will provide this to you if uh, my email and I'll give you my contact here. Um, you can follow me on LinkedIn. I don't do any other social media. I'm not that good at marketing when it comes to social media. That's just me. I'm old fashioned, I guess. Um, but you can follow me on LinkedIn if you want that sheet. I can send it to you on one page. Um, but what I, if there's anything I want you to take away from this in your branding is make it simplified. Make it simplistic. There's always that number one question when you go to interview. There's other qualified individuals. Tell us why we should hire you. And if you say, well, I'm a people person and I'm this kind, everybody says that. So if you can define yourself in a nutshell of a brand, you will win the game. And that's what we do with Gila River. So, yeah, yeah thank you. All right. Thank you, Dominic, for that. And I definitely like the You Do You campaign. I think that's neat. And that's cool. I didn't know that you guys were aiming it towards those people that need to like let loose and let their hair down. It's kind of like a Vegas thing, right? So what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So the same thing happens over there. 
what happens at Gila River Hotels and Casinos stays over there. I'm hoping that's right because <laughs> I'll be letting my hair down after this season. Okay, guys, so we do have another speaker, but first we want to thank a couple sponsors. So we want to thank our sponsor, Stellar Technologies, for providing some of the grant funding that will be awarded at the end of this series. We've been talking about it all series long. We're up to $10,000, so you do not want to miss out on that. So a message from Wayne Johnson, the CEO of Stellar Technologies, a Phoenix-based cloud provider. So he says, we're honored for the opportunity to be a sponsor of this series and to help give back to our communities and build something special. We look forward to seeing the new businesses that, to, that become a success. If you're an entrepreneur and you have no idea about technology or cybersecurity, that's okay. He's like, we're happy to explain the things and eliminate the confusion around IT. He's like, check us out on stellar.tech or click at the ad below, which is right there live online for more information and thank you. So make sure you do that so you can get some more information. But now it's time for our next speaker. So, you know, a long time ago, I was talking to an older gentleman and I was younger, probably like 14. And he said, hey, if you want to be successful in business, work for a funeral business, a wedding business or anything that has to do with babies. He goes, because those will never stop producing. And I'm like, wow, that is so true. <laughs> right. So fast forward all these years, those are still thriving and succeeding to this day. So our next speaker decided to go with the baby and mommy business and she is doing well with that. So let's give a big warm welcome to Lorena Garcia of Mashka. Hi guys, how are you? Thank you so much for being here in person. It's been a long time since we're not here in person, but thank you to State 48 for having me today. I'm so excited to be talking to you guys today about e-commerce. So I think it's a growing field. I'm super excited about it. And I'm gonna try to go fast with the presentation because I have a bunch of slides. So here's what we'll go over today. So I wanna talk about a formula of how we've grown Mashka. So before we get into it, so Mashka got started about three years ago and what we do, our whole mission is that we help moms feel their best so they can be the best for the people they love most. Somehow, and I will not go along in this, but somehow our society has normalized that new moms have to feel tired and have to feel horrible. And we truly believe that though that is common, it should not be considered normal. So with our products and with our educational resources, we like to think that we transform new moms' lives. And in that way, we also transform families and communities. So this is pretty much how we have grown the brand. And it is my, I made that up, PTCCR formula. So it's all about community, it's all about presence, traffic, conversion, and results because you cannot grow what you don't measure, right? So this is me really quickly. So trained a lot of people before being part of Mashka. I was part of a branding agency and a local company called Blogettes in which we did in-person and virtual trainings. So one day I decided that instead of doing branding and marketing for other people, I was just going to follow my passion in wellness and do it for myself. So Mashka has grown to be a very big business over a six figure business in this two and a half, three years that we've had it. I'm currently the CEO and its co-founder. So 12 years being an entrepreneur. And then I just wanted to start by my biggest mistakes when I got into e-commerce, right? So the first one was I started without a plan. And it's not that you have to have like a complete gigantic business plan because you're never going to start. But one of the things that I wish we would have done a little bit better in the beginning was not just get so excited about the product and the brand that we didn't do a lot of research, for example, into like our costs of shipping and like just a little like details and logistics that would have made a big difference for the business in the beginning. And then not getting a mentor sooner, our business skyrocketed when I started reaching out to people and just knowing that if you reach out, majority of people will say yes, like people that are doing what you're doing and are growing their business will say yes. So I've had a lot of mentors along the way that have made a significant difference on the business. And then the other one, just trying to do it all myself. So a lot of you here are probably entrepreneurs who are thinking of starting a business. And one of my biggest mistakes was trying to do everything, right? Like I was working, I don't even know how many hours a day trying to do our digital marketing, trying to run our social media, trying to be the director of photography, like it just doesn't work. So trying to do everything yourself doesn't work. If you don't have the resources, you can find them everything from like hiring a couple of hours of a virtual assistant and freeing your time up from email, like little things like that make a huge difference on your business. So are you late to the e-commerce game? No, you guys, it's growing so much. So I just wanted to 
give some really exciting statistics. So at least they excite me. So revenue for e-commerce in for 2020 was $431 billion. You guys, just on the way here, my dad was driving me and I bought three things on the way here. So don't lie to me, like even now, like if you're on Zoom or whatever, like how many times have you looked at your phone, open it with your eyes and use that Apple Pay that's wonderful to buy something, right? So everybody, it's like monopoly money. So you're always buying stuff. The industry is growing so fast. By 2040, around 95% of all purchases are expected to be via e-commerce, you guys. That is huge. But at the same time, a lot of money is going through it that 95 percent of people are expected to buy via e-commerce like majority of their purchases yet as today just 17 percent of purchases compared to retail go through e-commerce so though it's a huge industry there's huge opportunity for growth and for new people to get into it um 80 percent of internet users in the us have made at least one online purchase and COVID really accelerated that adoption even on the older generations and 20% industry growth right now, which is amazing. So if you're in it, if you're not in it, you need to get in it. So we're gonna start with presence, then we're gonna go into traffic, we're gonna go into conversion, community and results. So we're gonna do it quickly because we don't have much time. So this is something that a lot of entrepreneurs going into e-commerce overlook. You have to have a brand, you have to have an experience. So regardless if you're saying, if you're selling an online course, a uh, pre-made template, or if you're selling physical products, you need to have a brand and you need to have an experience. So customers buy emotions, they buy connection and they buy experience. So yes, your product needs to be amazing for your customer to come back, which is one of the things that we're gonna talk about on e-commerce success of lifetime value. But the first time they're not buying because your product is amazing. They're buying because of your brand and the experience that you're giving them. So whether you're creating it for the first time or you have a current brand, this is your foundation. Before thinking of growing sales, work on your brand. That is the foundation for growth. Um, it's important to consistently ensure it's resonating with the customer in current times. And there's two things that you think about it when you think about your brand, right? You're always thinking about the visual aspect of it. We spend so much time thinking about your logo, your colors, like all of those things. And those are all so important. I mean, you, we are all visual, right? You go into a group of people and you immediately see people and you start making judgments. We are all also individual brands. So the visual aspect is important, but also the non-visual aspect is so important. Like you have here, like the emotional part. So working on what the experience is, what's your actual promise that you have for your customers? What's your voice, your personality? Like I'll give you a quick example. Like when you go into our Mashka website, if you go into a 404 page, I know who cares about 404 pages, right? I do. I'm very A type. I look at everything that we do. Our 404 page says, oops, we have mom brain. Please visit another. Instead of like your typical 404 error, you guys, every single customer that buys from Mashka gets a personal email from me telling them and thanking them for being part of the business, thanking them for being part of our community, asking how we can help them and I make my best, however I can organize those emails, I will get to those people. Even if it takes me two weeks, I will get to those people. And that has brought us so much business, just by taking care of those like small little details, you know? So always pay attention to this. And I think you guys will get the presentation, but if you have any questions on the different aspects, we could do a whole presentation on each one. So we'll move on, but just make sure you care about your brand. And these are just some examples. Clearly Mashka's there in the beginning. So you can see how even like how we portray the mother, how we portray the colors of the brand. You guys, in the beginning when we were getting started and we didn't have credibility in the supplement business, people were buying because they liked our website. I know it's like, it's crazy. We used to get emails that it's like, I just love having your container in my kitchen. And I was like, no, you guys like read the vitamins. You should love them because they make you feel good, not because they look good in your kitchen. But it matters, you know, so it matters so much. Like these are just some examples like Glossier, like grew because of their brand. They grew a gigantic community, not because they have the best makeup products. It's because they have a good brand. Same with uh, True Botanicals and Not Pot, like the CBD gummies. So those are just some examples. And these are just some elements of your online presence that require some attention and that will give you e-commerce success. So. Think about your domain. You guys, your website is everything. Like we were talking about from the beginning. Think about when you're gonna go, even like when you wanna buy a PDF from someone, right? You land onto the website and you don't like it or the website doesn't look good. 
you immediately make a judgment of the quality of the product based on what you see. Like if you see that the website doesn't look good or doesn't feel right, you're going to immediately assume that the product that is being sold there is not high quality. So a website is super important. Email and SMS marketing, incredibly important. Same for your brand. That's your communication with your customers. Like Dominic was talking about it. Like you acquire and then you retain, right? So, and then your social media and your blog. So when you're thinking about having e-commerce, it's not just your store, it's your whole presence online. And then the second aspect of the formula is traffic. So now you have a great product, you have a beautiful website. Now you need people to come to your website to buy, right? So you have to think about ways in which to bring traffic to your website. So with e-commerce success, it's about thinking strategically. How are you going to bring traffic to your website that has intent? Because you don't just want, like for Mashka, for example, like we don't want probably the 50 year old or the 15 year old woman that is looking for supplements that it's just wasted traffic for us because we're not the product for them. So how do you direct good traffic to your website? And a couple of ideas that I had here for you guys is organic SEO. Like I know people are not focusing on SEO anymore, but you guys, it's huge. Like think about it for a brand like us, for our lactation products, for example, there's no better traffic than that mom looking how to increase my milk supply. So how do you find them? Really good, high quality content, working on your SEO, really, really important. Your social media presence, that's where you host your community and that's what's gonna direct a lot of traffic as well to your website. Paid advertising, we've seen a gigantic shift in paid advertising, which we're not gonna get to right now, but with all the privacy issues on iOS, like a lot of e-commerce brands struggled with their funnels, but now we're getting back, but still paid ad, it's a very effective way to get very specific traffic to your website. Influencer marketing, affiliates, building backlinks. These are all ways that regardless if you're selling a physical product or an online class can get you traffic to your website. And traffic is so important, you guys. We're gonna talk about conversion, but the average conversion rate on a website, a good conversion rate is 2.6%. So you do your math of how much traffic you need to bring to your site if you want to make a good amount of money converting at 2.6, 3% if you're incredible at converting, like that is. So you need to bring a good amount of traffic and have a plan for that traffic. So this is just for people that say that it doesn't, that you don't need to focus on content anymore. But I, I am a big believer on content, like 5.6 billion searches every day on Google. 70% of people in the US have a social media profile. 46% of product searches start in Google, you guys. You do it for everything. I've Googled like, what's the best toilet paper? Like everything, you Google everything. You know, I spent 45 minutes Googling for like blue light blocking glasses the other day. So you Google everything. And I bought the ones that were recommended for me on an article. So they work. 27% of internet users say they find products and brands through paid ads, very effective. And 70%, 17% of companies spend over half their marketing budget on influencers. This, Third aspect of the formula, it's conversion. What we were talking about right now, thinking about the user experience, like understanding that your website is your funnel for a sale, right? So if someone lands on your website, what are they gonna see? Like how can they quickly understand what problem you solve for them? That is the number one thing why websites do not convert. How many times have you landed on a website, you guys, that you're like, oh, this is cool. Oh wait, I don't understand what they're selling. Like, and right now our attention spam, it's like literally three seconds. It's like a little kid going on YouTube, changing videos. We don't have an attention spam. So if we don't understand immediately what that website is selling and how that product can help us, it's not gonna happen. So it's very, very important to have a clear message on your website. And here I added it. So traffic that has no intent to buy is no traffic. It's really like, I mean, you can put a medal on yourself if you have thousands of people on your website, but if they're not doing anything, that that's a sign that your website is not optimized for conversion. So thinking about your website being inviting, being well-branded, but also having a good experience and having a conversion strategy is imperative for your business. Like, for example, like you can run promotions like to test conversions. Those are things that work really well. Like some of the things that we do for Mashka sometimes after people have visited our website a couple of times and they haven't purchased, we'll offer them a sample box for a very affordable rate in which, and then they're in our ecosystem and we can start 
adding value to their life with a lot of content, they can get to know who we are, what we do, and then we can turn them into like a conversion. But first we focus on that educational content. There's many strategies for conversion, but I think that clear messaging on your website and your product pages, it's just crucial for you to see. If people don't understand how that product can help them, I see big mistakes being made in terms of like, we made it in the beginning. Our product pages when we launched Mashka, because I was so proud of the ingredients, me and my co-founder, that all the product page used to say was like, we have 57 ingredients. We have methylfolated folate, you know? And like our customers would be like, what's methylfolate? You know, like, how can it help me? And I was like, how come you don't know? How come you don't know what probiotics are, you know? And all of a sudden we changed the messaging and it's like, well, our product will give you more energy. Our product will make sure that your hormones are balanced. Like then it's like, oh, I get it. Who cares like what ingredients are on it? Like I, I want it clean and I want to reinforce them that the product is clean, but I want to know what that product is going to do for me. So we really saw conversions grow when we clarified our message. The next one, you guys, is community. And Dominic was saying it too, like your community is your boss. They make the rules and you follow to offer what they need. We are constantly, even if you have, this is a big mistake. And even for you guys here that are not wanting to sell product, that you're just wanting to build a community or want to sell a digital product, we sometimes put out there what we think people want. Or we think that we need an audience of, 50,000 followers to tell us what we should put out there because if not, it's not worth it. You guys, I've seen very successful small online communities with a thousand people, but where the person leading is consistently asking that community, what do they want? What do they need? And building products and services that go around their needs. And that builds community, feeling heard and feeling heard from a brand, understanding that like that builds retention. So Every single customer is a potential brand ambassador. You guys have to know that whatever you're starting, acquisition is expensive. So turning your customers into brand ambassadors, it's important. And you do that through the power of community. Um, here we have it. Like it costs you five to 25 times more to acquire each new customer than it takes to retain them. So focusing your whole marketing strategy and your e-commerce funnel on acquiring is not going to be a sustainable business if you cannot retain your customers. And community is a big part of retention and a big part of why they stay. They're not going to go to another brand if they feel like they're part of something. If they're just buying product, it's very easy to change product. It's not very easy to change communities. Um, longevity and value of your business, it's your community. And understanding their needs and wants need to become second nature to your business. On all of our marketing meetings, that's the first thing we do. Like, what did our customers say on the survey? What did they respond to my personal email? What are they liking? What's our customer satisfaction rate? Like, all of those things are just such an important part of our business. And I think it's been a big reason of why Mashka grew so quickly. Um, what do you need to build a community? So define your company's impact. Your company's impact is more important than your products. You guys, there's always trends. Like even us on, our, on the supplements, yesterday it was collagen. Tomorrow it might be a new neurotropic that makes you 40 times smarter. Well, it's impossible to keep up with that, you know? So what really is your company is, is that value. It's that impact that you make. And that's the value of your company, not just your product. So we always say that our company is our mission and our products are our tools because the tools are always going to change. Um, so live your mission, give value-driven content, like, because the, you can email someone every day if you give them value. Mashka emails probably seven to eight times a week, but we try to make sure that every single email has value. Engage everywhere you can, connect creatively with your customers and make sure you connect them with one another. Um, reviews help new customers to buy products and also to build community as well. And then you can't grow what you can measure. So these are a couple of things that we measure in order to understand and build our whole strategy for growth. So of course our profit margins are super important. And this is, I put it at the top because a lot of entrepreneurs were so passionate about what we do that we're like, let's just do it, you know? And then it's like, oh my God, it wasn't a business. We can't sell it for like that price. You know, how do we grow it? So profit margins, we're always checking on those um, because there's always the perfect balance between the experience that you can give and how much you can afford to do, you know? So that's super important. Your conversion rate, we're always measuring conversion rate. Like always our website is running different tests. Like if we change 
Um, I can give you guys a very quick example, but we changed our reviews to the top instead of having them at the bottom. And that gave us a 0.5 raise in conversion. 0.5, like half a point in conversion is a lot for us. So it's always like measuring your conversion and making sure if your conversion rate is really low, like I was saying, who cares if you have so much traffic if you're not converting it. Average order value. This is something that everybody, whether you do classes, whether you sell like directly products, whatever you do in e-commerce, you need to be working at your AOV. If you're spending money to acquire a customer, you cannot spend more than your actual average order value is, or you're losing, even though if you're bringing a ton of customers through the door. So, and then once you bring them to the door, Dominic talked about it too, it's like acquisition and then retention. What's their customer lifetime value? Like how can you stretch that as much as you can and measuring that consistently? Um, there's a lot of new apps right now on e-commerce. If you're on Shopify or in any of those websites that actually before we used to do a ton of spreadsheets and things like that. Now there's an app called Triple Whale. There's Lifetimely that they'll give you those metrics and they also project your metrics. So it's really, really good and very helpful to make um, data-driven decisions. Always measure new customers because if you don't have a good pipeline of new customers coming in, there's always gonna come a time where your customer customers are gonna go down. So we always measure like at what rate we're bringing new customers sales growth of course and then very very important for everybody that's on the digital space ads are a huge part and digital marketing are a huge part of our business so making sure that you're making a return on that advertising spend and making sure that it's worth it for you and the last thing for me it's growing your store is never ending and the biggest thing is you guys like and i thought about it too when i just got into e-commerce i was like let's invest on a website let's put the website together and then let's just watch it sell and it just doesn't happen. You know, like we stared at the computer for many days and didn't happen. You have to work for it. You know, it's not just having your store, but the work is never ending. Like all of a sudden you're selling 10 items a day. Well, how can you sell 20? You're not going to sell them the same way you're selling 10. So it's never ending work. So if you guys watch this presentation and if you liked it, I think the only homework, it's like, Create a plan after you saw this, like take what is good for you, take what you think you can apply for your business and create a plan of how you're gonna apply it. Because we've all watched many presentations, we've all like been in many things, but unless you pick one thing you're gonna do, pick one thing to work on. If you still don't have a product, maybe pick on working your online presence. Work on your online presence and then the product will come. But pick one thing, if you already have your website, maybe you work on conversion. Pick one thing because it's really hard to work on everything at the same time. So questions to ask before creating your plan. Where am I now? What could be some quick wins? What we were talking about? Where do I wanna go? What are my biggest weaknesses? And what are my measurable goals? So I hope you guys liked it. Thank you. Thank you, Lorena. Oh my gosh, you shared some, shared some valuable information and I love how you send a personal email after a purchase. That's a nice touch and great information. I'm going to go back and rewatch this later myself because there was so much that I wanted to like go back and revisit. Um, so we're going to get ready for our Q&A with Dominic and Lorena. Um, but before we do that, we do have a message from one of our sponsors, Nextiva. They're going to share a message with you. So start typing in your questions in the comments so we can do that right after this. Nextiva has powerful, easy to use communication tools, which means deeper connections with your customers. And you can use these tools anywhere, the office, home, and everywhere in between. So no matter where you are, Nextiva keeps you connected with your customers and your teammates. Okay, we wanna thank Nextiva for that. So let's get ready for that Q&A part. We have Lorena and Dominic here. So while we're waiting for a few of the comments to come in online, do we have any questions here in the live audience? Okay. A question for you, Dominic. Could you just briefly describe guerrilla marketing? Yeah, so guerrilla marketing is technically um, doing an unorthodox advertising blitz, basically. So you're doing something like, um, I'll give you an example. I wanted a Guinness Book of World Records. And so I said, I, I started off with me wanting helicopter coverage. 
I wanted some way to have helicopter coverage because people didn't know where one location was. Lone Butte Casino. I could say it right now. You guys probably don't know where it's at, right? So I wanted helicopter coverage to show how close it was to the 202 and convenient so it'd be covered by media. The only way to do that is to create a spectacle, and that's guerrilla marketing. So we created the largest, world's largest bingo game, and it was actually outside. And we did bingo balls and everything. And what happened is it created, you know, four media coverages to take it over the top, and you're able to see the close proximity. So guerrilla is really an unorthodox type of approach to, to uh, advertising. It doesn't fall in your traditional stuff, doesn't fall in your digital stuff. Wrapping cars, you see uh, mobile billboards going along the way. That's all guerrilla marketing techniques. We posted... Uh, 10,000 post-its with our website all over the city. All it has our website and we put it inside coffee shops and everything. Everybody's looking and going, what is this? I gotta, I gotta see what it is. So that's, that's kind of gorilla. Does that answer your question? All right. Um, Lorraine, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your process to content creation, uh, whether it's video or post or how you go about that. And, and, and um, just really how what you put out there and how you think about what you put out there as you're creating content. Perfect. So, yes, that was one of the most, like, I would say, like, difficult process to create for the business. But we're really focused on solving problems. So how we, our content creation process starts is by identifying, like, what issues our customers are facing, right? So um, we're a lot in the lactation space. So sorry for you guys, but like, it's like, so it's like, how do I have more milk supply for my baby? Like how I make sure I have more energy. So understanding what are the common concerns that our customers have, that's usually the beginning. And there's many, right? One topic can turn into 20. So that's a good way of knowing. We also like take a look around at what's going on on like social media and like other like mom Facebook groups are an excellent source of content ideas. You know, like let's say that you're targeting like maybe wellness entrepreneurs that like you go into a wellness group and then all of a sudden you see all these questions that people are asking that are relevant. And that's a great start of creating content. But what we do to make it efficient is once we decide on a topic, we go all the way with it. So let's say we're going to talk about increasing milk supply. We're going to do a blog post. We're going to do an Instagram live. And then we're probably going to, after we're done with that live, we're going to download that live. We're going to cut it into like great, like the best pieces of that live and reuse those pieces of content as posts and then as videos on YouTube. So we try to make it because we are a small team. So we need to make the most out of the resources. So the whole process starts with identifying the needs and then making sure that whatever content we're going to produce can go into diff in different forms, but in all of our channels, also to be able to amplify our message. I don't know if that answers your question. Question for you guys. Can you, I know it's new, but can you kind of talk about your su success with overcoming the iOS privacy update on the digital side? Either one of you can answer, both you can answer, but... I know it's a challenge, but <laughs> very passionate about that. You guys, like I was so worried. Like, I feel like all e-commerce brands, we saw like this, like skyrocket growth with COVID, like, you know, everybody was inside. And then all of a sudden, again, monopoly money with Apple pay, you're just looking at your phone and buying things. Everybody, like all of our brands started growing so fast. And then all of these privacy issues came, right? So right now, the whole success of digital marketing is being able to serve personalized ads, right? So those personalized ads are based on like what that user is doing online. So if we cannot track those things, it's more, more difficult to provide a personalized experience. But something that we have done at least that has been really, really effective is we rely on Facebook, Instagram, Google, all of those platforms for customer acquisition. And something that has been working really well before the iOS update, we were all of our campaigns for all of you guys that run campaigns were very specific. Like we were running a ton of campaigns at the same time, very specific audiences. Like we would like do like a lot of lookalike audiences from our audience and very specific, like just a lot of campaigns. And something that we've seen a lot of success with right now, and that is like, for a lot of people in the e-commerce world, it's letting Facebook do their magic. So we kind of like revert it. And now we're consolidating campaigns with bigger audiences. So instead of trying to be super narrow and just say like target new mothers and breastfeeding, like giving Facebook the opportunity to target larger audiences and giving it the, the opportunity to optimize. So 
it was a huge shift in how we are doing digital, but I think just minimizing the amount of creative that was being put out there and condensing our campaigns. Like we went probably from, no joke, like probably 15 top of funnel campaigns for acquisition to two. And those two campaigns are doing better than the 15. So I feel like that is one of the things. And then also Facebook like has just been posting a lot of content around it. They know about the issue. They know that a lot of people are dealing with like conversion issues and all of these things. So making sure that you're not measuring attribution just purely by what you see on Facebook, but just by seeing your overall sales and seeing the impact on online advertising as seeing as an overall. Also, just real quickly, I don't know if you guys saw, but with the new iOS 15, you're not going to be able to do a lot of tracking on email marketing as well. So just trying to adapt to that. And before we used to optimize for open rates and now we're optimizing all of our campaigns for click rates. So I feel like you just have to adapt, but those are some of the things that we have done. You well said, I mean, <clears throat> um, so we're a brick and mortar operation, as you know, uh, we don't, we don't sit in the e-commerce space too much. Um, but what I will tell you is we are a huge data house. Um, we started off a, a Play Hilo, which is a mobile platform for gaming. It's, it's, basically, it's basically fictional gaming. Um, but through that, we're able to capture data through that and funnel it back into likeness. And uh, we really don't get flagged too much. Um, so that's good. And uh, it seems to be working out. We have a lot of data that we're able to just embed in it. And it's basically retargeting likeness of our current players. Nice. Thank you. Okay. There's, here's a question from our online community. It's from Yasmin. It says, is there a place where we can have our website evaluated for UX? Website. User experience. Um, evaluated. I don't know. There's usually like, I've used like personally, like a lot of like freelancers, like even like on freelancer.com, like I always look that there, there's experts for everything. So I think that would be a way to go. I don't know if there's a specific, but honestly, I think your best user experience advice comes from people using your website. So adding like questions in your website or like a questionnaire, if you have an email list, I think that's the best way to go. But there's a lot of like freelancers that will do that for you as well. Okay. This next question is from AC. It says, when did you know you hit milestones? Was it goals or bumping up against moments of not having enough bandwidth? What did that look like and what did you do? How did we know we hit milestones? Is that the question? Mm -hmm. ah. Well, I think based on goals, right? Like, well, like if you hit a goal, you've hit a milestone. Like, I feel like we're very specific with like, at least in Mashka, we're very specific with, okay, what's our revenue goal? What's, we have goals for all of those the results that I was talking to you about, our AOV, our LT, like our lifetime value, average order value. So once we hit that goal, we just move on to the next. We're always striving for more, but I think you know you've hit a milestone when you've reached your goals, and I think it goes back to planning. But yeah, for us, we we have two sets of goals. One is a brand accomplishment, and one is revenue. Right? Revenue is pretty easy; you can see it coming in. You know how to measure it. Um, we do a brand tracking study uh, on a on a six month basis, and basically what it is is what we believe in. What I showed you guys in brand, <clears throat> excuse me. What we believe in, we go out to survey. We ask the same 20 questions every six months and we send it out. And what comes back, we can see in our trajectory, are we going the right way in our brand? We thought we are the largest gaming enterprise in the Valley. Do people believe it? And as we keep advertising and using that metric, we ask the same 20 questions every six months. And so that's kind of a metric for us that we use to make sure we're attaining brand goals. Okay. We have another question. This is from Chad and this is for both of you. It says, going back to the guerrilla marketing, is there a way to measure I RIO when it comes to vehicle wraps, billboards, et cetera? So that's a great question. Um, ROI is, is always suspect on a lot of traditional advertising. Digital, you can gauge it a little bit better, which is nice, right? Um, TV, I mean, you're on TV spot. How do you know what it's generating for you in revenue? Uh, gorilla is the same sense. So as long as you use Gorilla with an intent to do something reflecting the brand or getting awareness around a product, you should see an uptick based on when you do it. So if I'm doing Gorilla marketing on a certain day or a certain time, I want to fly. I want to do a drone show. I want to take over the, the city actually and do drone shows of you know three to four hundred drones in the sky with our logos. That's a, a Gorilla marketing technique. I should see if I do that around my property at a certain time. I should see the lift in revenue and volume at the time I do it. And that's the only way you could really ROI measure guerrilla marketing techniques because it's a long-term goal for your brand. It's not an instant value. I agree. And I feel like at least for us, all of our marketing initiatives, 
we're clearly not as big as killer casinos so we have to be more careful with our budget no like but um no we everything we do has to be segmented into like we know so if we're gonna put some money into digital marketing we know we need a specific uh return on ad spend from that but we also we have pillars of our marketing strategy and we have a specific pillar that is just for brand awareness so on that one on the brand awareness pillar that one we might do like an email campaign with like a collaborating brand or we might do a like mini commercial on you like on other ways like so i feel like for those like marketing tactics that are meant to be for brand exposure we don't necessarily measure the roi we just observe overall sales if, if i can add to that because that, that is a great question um what i will say is most companies get into a problem of layering promotions and when you layer multiple promotions, you will never know what works out. So if you're going to do guerrilla marketing, turn off everything else, right? And don't put an effort towards it and go do guerrilla marketing and see what it does. Test it and control it. See if it works. But don't layer because you won't truly know if it's pushing, pushing the needle. Great advice. Thank you. Okay, this next one is from Judy. It's for Lorena. It says, do you recommend investing in video for products from the beginning or start with photographs and, build to, and then build to videos? So before a couple of months ago, I would have say like, go all in on video, you know, like video is like, but right now we're seeing if the video is going to be used specifically for digital advertising, we are seeing better results right now with images, with everything that's going on. But video is always so important to provide an experience, you know, like I feel like 80% of tri content that's going into social right now, they're expecting in the next year to be videos like with reels and TikToks. So I would say it depends on the type of video. So if it's video for like your regular, like social media presence, 100%, you know, you're gonna be on top of majority of, the, of those posts. But I wouldn't say go spend a lot of money right now with the current situation of digital advertising and doing like, like a commercial for ads or something like that, I would hold on a little bit to see what's working better. But definitely like simple video with your phone for your brand, that works great. Like that works better. And something that you can use too to create a video is user generated content. Like user generated content works for your organic social media presence, for your paid advertising. And you can get it from your customers, from your best customers. And there's other platforms too that are now dedicated to create user generated content. Like one of them is Billo, B I L L O. They dedicate, they're dedicated to create um, that user generated feel type of video and they're very affordable for companies. So, so we are, we are heavy video um, just because the business we're in. Um, we're actually heavy video on floor. So when you come into our brick and mortar operation, we want to show you other elements that are in the property. Um, you know, we're, we're a large over 100,000 square feet basically in these properties and you won't know what's going on in that 25,000 square feet on the other side. So what we try to show you in areas is a glimpse of what you would be looking at in the totality of the, of the uh, property. So we use a lot of video um, and we complement it with, uh, you know, the still photos. The way I look at it is, you know, still photos have a place on a, a three second to five second run, right? You're doing a social media ad or you're doing a billboard or something like that. That's quick. You got three to five seconds. You got to give that emotion right away. If I go into social website a little bit further depth email, I can embed video because now I got maybe 25 to 30 seconds of your time. So I can show you a little bit more onto that photo that I sent you and compliment it. That too as well too. In terms of like the type of video that you do, I'm gonna tell like a little bit of an experience. Like I think a year, over a year ago, we launched one of our new products and it was the first time that I was like, let's go all in and hire models. And like, we're gonna hire like a whole set and our video for our, it's our hair, postpartum hair recovery product is beautiful. I mean, the models are beautiful. The babies are beautiful. Like, but something that we realized we'd spend so much money on that video and it didn't connect with our audience. So what I'm getting to is that you need to test. There are some brands that are luxury brands that this type of video would have done incredible for them. But for us, wanting to talk to like the mothers that are going through like normal mom things, it didn't connect to see this aspirational model looking women like in the video. So we spend a lot of money in this like very high production video that overall we turned out really quickly. We worked with some of our customers that were actually using the products for them to create videos of the product. And those videos work way better for us. So I think it's also depending on what type of industry you're on and what's your product, 
what's going to work with your customers. But if you don't test, you'll never know. We have another question from in-house. I wonder to follow up to that, talk about your, your process to test. How long do you put a, a plan out there and then say, okay, this is definitely not working and cut it off? So th this may shock you, um, but we work in five-year increments. Um, we're a 27-year brand, basically. And so um, we've already went through, when you start a business, it's different. There, there are three-month or whatever six-month milestones, right, that you keep achieving. After 27 years or 25-plus years, you're looking at where's the next five years. And so we, we have time to kind of trajectory because you already build your retention, right? Your, your main base is already there. Um, so we look a little bit longer. Um, there is small goals that we'll test um, that fit within the larger goal. But I, I simplify everything, man, to be honest with you. Like my, I have a big six. That's a five-year plan is a big six. Like out of five years, we're going to accomplish six things. And they're going to be big things, but we're going to accomplish those six things. So I'm, I'm very simplified, but long-term. On our business, is a little bit different, right? We're focused on like really converting people on the website. So testing is everything for us. So usually we'll give it like either a certain amount of sessions or a certain amount, maybe like if we're implementing like, let's say changes on the website that are meant to trigger like better conversion, we'll try them for at least like, we'll give them a thousand sessions. We think that's a good number for us to like determine if something's gonna work or not. So every test go through a thousand sessions and then we make the next one. So we are, we have our, goals like our metrics for goals of very specifically for us that drives growth is new customer acquisition ltv and aov like those three so all of our testing goes around those three and we are very quick to know like it is either a thousand sessions or like some of our tests will go out for like maybe two weeks a month everything for us is on our website that that part of the testing so if it's meant to do conversion like on the website very quickly on our ad campaigns we give it a little bit more time so maybe we'll run something for a little bit more time compared to that. Like we'll run something for 30, 45 days and give it a chance to see if it takes off. And then if it doesn't, we'll move immediately to something else. Okay. Our next question is from Kelly. It says, my business is a B2B. Can you advise me on how to get time with other larger businesses to make my pitch? The biggest thing I found, no, I, I'm B2C, so I'm totally opposite, but I'm going to chime in because I get hit up all the time from people trying to get in the business, right? Um, what I will say is a reference goes a long way. Anytime your, your current client that has a commonality can say, I use this person, it's, it's the same thing that Amazon does, right? Amazon does a net promoter score. That's what they ask you. Would you recommend Amazon to your family member? If you say yes, they think they're doing a good job, right? Basically, because you trust that, that product. It's the same thing. When somebody walks through and go, oh, I, I know Dominic, like I know what he's selling. We use his product. He's great. And I know Dominic. I'm more open to open my door. But if you cold call me or that kind of stuff, I, I really don't answer it, to be honest with you. Nothing to add to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Our next one is from Tara. It says, can you explain more about the two funnel for acquisition and campaigns? The what? Two funnel. Two funnel? Like the f our funnel of acquisition? Yeah. Or like his funnel acquisition. I'm just Both. reading what they said. I'm like, Tara, can you clarify? <laughs> and so she just wrote, can you explain more about the two funnel for acquisition and campaigns? Yeah, I, I think I know what she's talking about. So um, to make it understandable, the business, the way I put it, was a funnel. Um, and you try to keep everybody in the middle of the funnel. That's your loyalty base, right? Um, what was happening is, yeah, we'd fill two and we would cheer about that, but we were losing five without us even noticing. And so, yeah, acquisition's great and the loyalty's great, but you got to look who's leaving your company. And I'm sure you test this all the time. Who has bought a product and never came back? And why is that happening? Because I just, she, she mentioned it, it costs you a ton to get those people back and, and get their love back. So the way I say it is um, you're in a marriage that you can't divorce. Um, you walk into our property, good luck leaving us. Because once you try to leave us and when you go distance for five weeks or so, we're on you. And we're mailing you a lot of offers and trying to figure out exactly why you don't want to be with us. You may never come back, but at least it's information that we know that we can use for the next time so it doesn't happen again. So we try to plug that funnel up, basically. And as you keep throwing to the top, two to the funnel, right, um, you keep growing your business. And as far as our top of funnel, how it works, we're really value-based. 
So at the top of the funnel, especially with the customer that we have, we never go for the sale. So our top of funnel is just like our top of funnel strategy is very value based. So we go with a lot of content. We make sure that we answer the most common questions that our audience is going through. And of course, like I feel like you give, 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 and then you ask, right? So after they've seen like probably five or six of our really great value-based posts and how we determine what's valuable is what has done great probably on our organic social, we'll bring it onto paid and we'll start using that for people to discover us through value-based content. And once they've seen like, like maybe five or like four, at least four or five pieces of content where we're really giving them value, like we always say that our customer comes in feeling a little bit confused and with lack of control and every single piece of content that we need to put out there needs to provide confidence and empowerment and make them feel in control. So let's say that they're dealing with X problem postpartum, like our content will solve that. And then all of a sudden it's a point for us because we've helped them. So our, our whole top of the funnel is focused on value and content. And then once we've like giving them exposure to the brand, then we'll go for the conversion or, or the sale. After we've given, given, then we ask. And that's the whole structure of our top of funnel. Okay, here's another question. It says, when branding and advertising, is it better to spread wide or limit platforms? I think you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but it's for either one of you. Well, well for me, it depends on your intent. So if I'm in a couple gorilla with it, then I, I blast everywhere. I, I, every medium I'm on. Um, and it's very disciplined though. It's the same exact content across all. There's so many platforms going on that it's overload. So you kind of got to hit every single one. Um, but if I'm looking at a specific market, 21 to 45, um, I'm not hitting every medium. I'm not going to put it on a TV because 21 to 45, I have a 20 year old daughter. She's not watching news or TV, so I'm not putting it on there. Sorry. I'm not putting it on there, but I may put it on YouTube. I may put it on Twitter. I may put it on those channels right there. So I get really focused depending on the demographic. If I'm launching a brand for the first time, um, and it seems to be in my business, uh, our demographic is wide. We're 21 to 80 years old, right? We have a wide spectrum of, of, of clientele. So I kind of got to hit every single platform that's there, um, but make sure the content is applicable to where I'm putting it. Yes, I totally agree with that. There's perfect content for every platform. And I guess it also depends like, one of the things it's like, where's your audience? Like he was saying, right? You know, like for us going on Twitter will probably not be necessarily the best fit. So we really know that Instagram is really big for us, like especially within our demographic of like the 25 to probably 38, which is our customer base. We really hit Instagram really hard. And it's also depending on the amount of resources that you have, right? So if you have a lot of resources and you're able to test on a lot of platforms, that's perfect. But if you have limited resources, and especially if you're starting, you should go after the platform where you think majority of your audience is and hit them with the content that they're already looking for in that content. I think like one of the biggest successes of like advertising on any of these platforms is being able to provide content that will look native to that platform. She said it, go for your quick wins. Find your wins, find your easy wins. Everybody says it, low hanging fruit. Find out what that is, get that first, build your base, and then you can start chiseling off. You'll get glimpses as you run your business. You'll get glimpses into potential markets. We didn't know 21 to 45 was an option for us. We always stayed in 40 to 80. Our, our marketing said we were good to go that way. Um, but what we found is our core base produced the most revenue. If you look at 40 to 80 years old, the highest revenue. 21 to 45, the lowest revenue. But if you take five years, you will see this group is stagnant with a 2% growth. These guys off the charts, 32% growth year over year. So they may not be contributing a lot, but a long-term goal five years was to go, they're growing at a rapid pace. There's potential there, even though it may not be high valuable right now, how do I get that market to be eventually in the middle of that funnel? Something just to add real quickly to that, like. I feel like especially with the smaller entrepreneurs and if somebody's watching and they're thinking on starting a brand or like their presses online, like it takes a little bit of time. Like even if you get into these platforms, like again, like, and then it turns like into like a little bit of a snowball effect. Once you get your first customers, it's like the first 10 were really difficult, but the next 20 are not as difficult. Like it just starts growing like a snowball. So you have to have a little bit of patience. I remember when we first started going into Facebook advertising, you guys, we made the decision and I was like, we're golden. Like, I'm going to wake up tomorrow and it's going to be 10x 
Like, I really it's going to be crazy, you know? And I remember looking on my phone because Shopify has an, an app, you know, for your sales. And I was like, well, our campaigns are up. And it's like, Too. like, I would wake up in the middle of the night and look like at the app and it's like zero sales, man. But it took us really three months to really build that funnel, like really putting that content out. And once the first sales started coming in and Facebook was able to optimize for our audience. So the beginning, it takes a little bit of time when you get into these platforms and especially in advertising. But once you get them going, it's like you you get and as we see a lot of people like leave really early where they're like, hey, I tried a month of Facebook ads and it didn't work. No, like maybe you were like a couple of weeks of like them working, but the beginning is really hard. But if you're persistent and if you keep trying, once you get the first group of customers, it starts growing from there. So for everybody, like everybody that's starting or thinking on starting, like it's it's that start that takes a little bit of traction. But once you get it going, it just goes. So don't give up. No. <laughs> I, I would not build a plan less than three years. If you're starting a business, do not build a plan that's less than three years because you will never see it bloom. Like stay in the game. I love it. All right. This question is from Dusty and it's for Lorena. It says, hi, I'm from livebandit.com. Great information. First off, it says we are a new local startup and our biggest challenge has been the ROI with a driving customers to our webpage and then converting new customers. We are considering setting up an, Am an Amazon store, sorry, and wanted to get your thoughts on how Amazon works for you. Amazon works great for us, but Amazon is, it's really expensive first to sell on Amazon. So Amazon for us, how it works, it's more of like, probably 15 to 20 percent of our sales come from amazon but amazon sales are really driven by brand sales like if your product was not specifically optimized from the beginning for amazon it's very difficult to just grow exponentially on amazon right amazon is like amazon sales are driven by reviews and price so for example for us we are a very premium brand so my, our acquisition doesn't happen on amazon people that are buying our products on amazon are because they're already familiar with the brand and they like the convenience on amazon so i think like there's two ways of selling on amazon either you built enough brand awareness that people are gonna buy your products off of amazon and look for them there or you have a product that has been optimized for amazon and it's going into a category where there's space and you can get reviews fast and you're going to compete well on price. So that's my opinion on, on Amazon specifically. I, I would just look at the Amazon market field that you're going into and go, is it very niche? And, and are people going to notice that? Because what you're potentially doing is you're putting yourself in a, a listing of millions of categories. So you just increased your, your you know, toughness to get noticed. Um, I probably would research the current base that I have, find out why the conversion is not happening. Uh, where am I failing at? Fix that first. See if it remedies it first, because there's th there's reasons why they're not converting. You got to find that out first before I go and I get in the marketplace of Amazon. They're a monster, and if I put my product in there and there's ten other ten thousand other products, I I'm 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 in a waste again. So I really identify first what the conversion problem is. Once I identify that, you might see just automatic change. Really quickly to add to that, the number one thing that we see with conversions, it's messaging. Like if people don't understand really quickly what how that product is going to add value to them, they're gone. Like in three seconds, either if you're selling clothes or something like that, either you get them with like the looks real quickly, or if you're selling something else, if they don't understand, majority of the times you're not converting because your messaging is not right. We I see big mistakes happening in e-commerce where the first reaction is like, discounts you know like let's discount it and see if like it actually converts or like but that's actually not the problem sometimes when you start asking people it's not the price that it's necessarily the problem it's usually that messaging that people are not understanding um why they should buy the product there's a really good book and a really good class called the brand story and it, it's actually really really helpful for a lot of brands they have like uh, an exercise there where you can create like your your brand messaging and it's very very helpful and very concise so but that's usually the number one thing it's like people don't understand why they should buy what you're selling great information i just want to say we have tons of comments here and everybody is loving what you guys are sharing and they said it's very informative and valuable do we have any last questions inside in-house we have a couple what are you first hey dominic um 
Can you talk about those three credos, how you guys came to those, if you came up with those or if those are legacy before you started? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, actually, I stole those from somebody else um, in actuality. So I should have cited it actually <laughs> um, to give, but it was a, a mentor of mine in the business. Um, he came from the Vegas market and uh, he said, if you stick with these, and those are things that I identified. What's interesting is in the industry and as you're hearing, there's mistakes that happen and it's common across the industry. We all make the same mistakes. We all think it's our own mistake. But what he identified is, is that these three things are valuable in our industry because every place he went, it was an issue. People wouldn't say they were going to do a special event, but it wouldn't look special. They just said they wanted to do it. Large in life, he was a big gorilla technique advertiser. I become that. So it's like everything's got to be big. So when they come in, their expectations become, they expect that. They walk into a casino, they expect to be wowed. So we did that piece. So that's it, it got carried over because it worked. Um, you don't have to reinvent a lot of stuff in the industry that you're going into. Somebody's already Ply created it and Ply works. Uh, this is mostly for you, Dom, but Lorena, if you have anything that makes sense, you know, it works too. Um, with something like, Something new coming to market like Arizona getting sports betting. How much in advance, knowing that it's coming in, are you already working on those marketing campaigns ahead of time versus, you know, watching to see what happens and then kind of reacting after once you deal with other people? You know, so maybe similar to like the iOS system, you knew it was coming and then you had to react one way or another. Did you plan ahead and how much planning ahead did you do? Yeah, thanks for the question. So, um, to give you a short answer, two years. Um, we got wind there was sports betting going to happen in Arizona. Um, not knowing if it was going to materialize, we said we might as well do our homework. Um, I flew around the country uh, looking at every single sports bet there was, meeting with every provider. I wanted to make sure the provider that we picked was aligned with our brand. That was first and foremost. All of them offer pretty much the same thing. If you look at it, the offers are the same, the platform, some of them have better pros and cons than others, right? But I was looking at in our business and going, what fits with our brand and what makes sense? Because I'm thinking five, 20 years down the road, how do we keep this going? The compact and the, and the legislation that was passed is 20 years, right? So sports betting is going to be a part of us for 20 years. I'm not thinking of what the quick is. What's the end result? And so we went with BetMGM for the number one reason that they know gaming. DraftKings and FanDuel, they don't have casinos, right? BetMGM, they have casinos. Another thing is that DraftKings and FanDuel are based East Coast, right? They're, they're predominantly in the East Coast. If I say MGM to you on the West Coast in Arizona, your mind goes automatically right to the strip and you're in Vegas all of a sudden. So I said, perfect, we're a casino. They know how to operate casinos. We speak the same language. It's a perfect partnership. And so we worked on this for two years. We've been developing the plan for two years. Um, the Cardinals graciously, graciously um, were willing to work with us. And uh, what you saw us produce, and this goes to the largest gaming enterprise in the Valley, um, partners like yourself in State 48, you want to be a partner with the largest thing in town. And likewise, when we looked at State 48, we made sure you guys were a big deal before we did it. And you were. So we said the Cardinals, BetMGM, and Gila River, the largest enterprise in each one of their sectors. You put those three together and the game's over. It's it's over. So it took a lot of work, but it was it nestled with the brand, right? We stayed focused with the brand. For us, it's a little bit different, but like for us, product development takes about a year and a half. So from understanding like the customer needs, so every new product takes about a year and a half. So we go from understanding customer needs to formulation and then testing and all of that stuff. But how we prepare our audience for launch is probably six or eight months before the product comes out. We start introducing conversation. So it's all about conversation. So if we know we have a new product coming out that it's going to be with let's say healthy weight loss postpartum, we'll start talking about it. We'll start doing lives. We'll start bringing experts. Like we won't mention anything about the product, but we build internally with our own community, our own market. So that when that product launches, there's already a lot of people that are ready for it. Like we kind of like start warming up, if you want to say new and existing audiences about six to eight months before a product launch. So the product doesn't launch like cold into like somebody that's not expecting it, but we've already built a need for it. All right. Well, that does it for our Q&A session. We want to thank Lorena and Dominic for 
helping us out tonight and giving us some great valuable information. You can always go back to this later on YouTube if you want to revisit the information that was shared. So thank you. But don't leave just yet. I do want to remind you that you should fill out that survey that's going to pop up as soon as the session ends. Now, I know you've seen this survey before and you're like, I've already filled this out. Okay, but you need to fill out the top two questions. Those are the most important questions that are regarding tonight's session. So if you fill out those two questions and you turn that in, you have a chance at winning some great prizes. I know Alyssa shared that information with you as the session started, but one of them is a one night stay at Gila River Hotels and Casinos. You knew that, right? Oh, okay. I'm just, I'm not, I'm, we're just throwing that in there. <laughs> so you definitely want to fill out that survey because you could be a winner of that. And those casinos are awesome. They have a D backs room. They have a Cardinals room and those are pretty awesome. So make sure you fill out those surveys, at least the top two questions to get that done. And just another reminder that the state 48 foundation is gifting $10,000 in grant funding. So if you want to get your hands on $500 of that money to help out your business, you you're part of the eligibility was watching five of the live sessions. So hopefully this was your fifth session. And then also you have to fill out the survey and then you also have to fill out an application that will be um that will happen at the end of the, all the sessions so make sure you get your guys's hands on some of that money thank you for joining us we want to thank cei for hosting us tonight we want to thank eic for producing the session tonight and of course we want to thank dominic and lorena for here being with us so the next session is next wednesday it's back to a wednesday this six at 6 p.m and then that focus is help um, identifying resources. So if you have any questions for the State 48 Foundation team, you can go ahead and email foundation at state48.com. Thank you for joining us. I hope you learned a lot today and keep after those dreams. Go get them.